Now, some of y'all old people don't know this, but there's another way of saying um, it's my fault, and that's what young people say. They say, my bad. So on the count of three, everybody say, my bad. All right, one, two, three. My bad. See, there you go. I'm helping the old people be cool this morning, too. It's a, the ministry of New Direction goes very far and very wide, people. Um, but one of the reasons that I want to talk about blame game is I talk to a lot of people all the time and in my counseling and just talking to people and, and finding out uh, why they didn't come to church or why they're not close to the Lord or why they're having a problem in their relationship, it's always somebody or something else fault. I rarely have to pull out of um, them anything outside of themselves as a reason why they're in a situation. Um, it often takes me weeks or months or years or never to, fit, to get them to figure out what their reasons are, what, where that might be their fault. It just might be maybe an outside chance of it not being everybody else. It might be in them. Is the reason why they're in that mess that they're in. Um, it's like the old man that was driving down the road one time. There was an old man driving down the road one time, and a car come up headed down the wrong direction of 264. And he said, good gracious, somebody's going the wrong direction. And after that, another car came by going the wrong direction. He said, what is going on? And 500 more. And, and an hour later, he was still saying, everybody is driving in the wrong direction on this Sunday morning. He didn't realize maybe, just maybe, it was him. Um, I used to be really good at this myself. Um, teenagers, I'm going to pick on y'all for a minute. Teenagers, um, when you get at a certain age in your life, you, you tend to, um, we all go through it. I think that some people are still in it even at 60, 70 years old. They never get out of this stage. But uh, people go through this stage of their life where they're always pointing the finger. If they're in a bad situation or they're not uh, being as fruitful, is what they think they are. If they got a character flaw, they're very quick to point the finger at other people. And I am big person now, now, currently. I am huge on being on time. Now, my wife isn't, but she's not in here. She's away with the kids. So now, I've got here through a training program right here. My very first rule to her training program is there's no excuses. Um, I am huge as far as, if I say I'm going to meet you at 12 o'clock now, I'm going to be there at 11.50. And if I'm not, then I'm like not a good person because when I'm running late, it tears my nerves up. I used not to be that way though. Michael can say that, but I know Michael said amen right there. I used to, when I used to work, I used to work my first real job. Michael's up there and Michael had seen me pull in. I was supposed to be at work at seven in the morning. Now we had a very laid back boss. Guess what time Matthew got to work? 7.02, 7.03, 7.15, you know. Because he, he was laid back and he gave me a lot of grace. More than I would have gave myself now if I, was, if I was my employer. But every time he asked me, he said, what was your reason? And I said, I got stuck behind a tractor. There was a school bus. Um, I had to pick up 14 kids along the way. Um, you know, I, had to t I couldn't find my keys. It was always some excuse. It was never really my fault. That was my excuse as I got pulled in the office. It was never my fault. It was never my fault. And finally, one day, somebody said something that was very wise. He said, no, you're just late because you just don't care. He said, it's your fault and your fault alone while you're a mistake. You know there's going to be a school bus. You know there could be a tractor. You know that it takes you 20 minutes to get to Snow Hill from where I used to live. You need to leave at 630. And, and finally, it made me realize that it was my fault. And that was the first epiphany at like, you know, 23, 24 years old that Maybe, just maybe, some things in this world were not everybody else in the situations around me. Maybe it was a character flaw that I had. What the devil had been doing is giving me excuse after excuse after excuse to justify my own fault in my own character. And that's a lot of times what Christians do. We'll show up, we'll show up late to the party in our faith. We'll show, we'll, we won't pray. We won't, uh, we, we won't tithe. We won't go to church like we're supposed to. We won't spend the time and invest the time in our spiritual life that we want to, but the devil always gives us an excuse. Parents, a lot of the excuse for parents is children. That's sad to say that the devil uses your biggest blessing to be your biggest excuse for your lack of your faith walk. But if you let him, the devil's always going to give you reasons to blame for your character fault. 
2 Corinthians verse 5, verse 10, or chapter 5, verse 10, it says, For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each, I should have underlined that word, each. That means each person, not, not each, uh, each reason why you were laid, each reason why you could. It says, we will each person receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done on this earthly body. Um, blame's a, a very uh, tedious, tedious task. Um, reasons for failure, reasons for not growing in your spiritual well, they can come in all shapes, all sizes. They can come in people, uh, pain, and circumstance. If you're following along in your outline, I have it there. And you can think about it. You can think about the things that the devil puts into people's lives to use them as a fallback on why I'm not who I know I'm supposed to be. Um, uh, my, my mama didn't hug me enough when I was a child. <laughs> or I had a rough relationship with my father. That's a real one that y'all know I had, you know. That could be a very well be a good excuse for me. It might be pain. It might be that I lost a loved one and I still haven't gotten away so that I turned into, into drugs and alcohol. It might, be, it might be a circumstance that I'm poor and I'm fighting through this fight of faith and I can't never get a break. And that's why I'm never ahead. Let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you something that somebody told me one time and it changed my life. Everybody has scars. Suck it up. <laughs> somebody told me that one time, and but they really jogged my memory because it, it the place I was at, I was using it as an excuse. I was using each and everything in my life that was negative as an excuse to not be Matthew Galloway, who I knew Matthew Galloway had me to be. And he said, man, when are you going to quit using everything bad that's happened as an excuse and use it as a reason? Everybody has scars. Everybody. Scars become one of either two things. They become an excuse or they become a testimony. And it took a lot of maturing in me, but I finally said that I'm not going to let every bad thing that had ever happened in my life and that happiness is a choice. Obedience is a choice. Following God, having faith is a choice. And I had to quit blaming everything that went wrong in my life for my own failures. And there was one person that had control over that. And it was me. It was me. See, the devil put little stepping stones in my way, little roadblocks. And so I figured, well, that's going to be a good reason why not to take that road. So I just went over here. When if I could, I could have just stepped over those roadblocks with the power of God. It would have been a little harder. It would have took some effort on my part. But that's what God has me to do. That's what God has me to do. God holds one person accountable. It's you. Now, a lot of you looking at this boat up here, Y'all been noticing I've been walking on water the whole time since I've been preaching this morning. <laughs> say, man, that's a heck of a preacher, right? <laughs> the Matthew chapter 14, uh, verse 22 through 31. We're going to read this real quick, and then I'm going to get into my whole boat thing here. You know you go to a Green County church when you walk in, there's a John boat sitting in there. <clears throat> God made us rednecks. We might as well be rednecks. <clears throat> Matthew uh, chapter 14, starting at verse 22. This is right after Jesus had, uh, had done a lot of his teachings. He had like thousands of people following him. He was looking to get away and go to another town to preach. Um, it says, immediately after this, I had to burp. I didn't want to do it loud on the microphone. I had to kind of stop real quick and do it in my mouth. Immediately after this, Jesus, that's my biggest fear, is like burping in the microphone of a sudden. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that it to his disciples that they get back in the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. And after sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. And night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. 
about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, It's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. He said, Don't be afraid. Take courage. I'm here. And then Peter, my boy Peter, I love this guy, he called out to him. He said, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. Now, but there were, he saw the strong wind and the waves. He was terrified and began to sing. He said, Save me, Lord. He shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. He said, You, you have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? Now, what I want to do is I want you to take, ta- when I read the story, when I, every time I read the Bible, I put myself in that place. In that place. Like, I, I really like think about, I think about, like, not just the things you think about, you know, like in children's books and stuff, but I think about, like, what it really looked like, you know. Like, it's three o'clock in the morning and you're on the Sea of Galilee which it ain't just it ain't a pond I mean it's like you can't see the other side of it in places I mean it's it's huge so it's basically like a mini ocean and they're in a boat and there's 12 dudes in this boat it says all disciples are there so I'm guessing it's a little bit bigger than my boat but you know they're in this boat and they're out there pitch black there ain't no lights out there. They didn't have no lanterns on the boat. They didn't have no running lights. They didn't have no outboard little hookups like Mario's got on his boat to show you where you're going. It's just pitch black. And all you know is that you're getting hammered by wind and waves are coming in over the bow and you're in trouble. The Bible said they were in trouble. Now, I've been out on a boat before in a storm. Ain't that right, Mario? Amen. Yeah. Like, I knew where I was. It was daytime, and I had some of my best friends and a life preserver there, and I was still scared. I was scared. And I can't imagine how scary it must have been at 3 o'clock in the morning, like out there just with that wind howling. And they say even now, like the Sea of Galilee is known for big storms coming up very quickly because it's so flat out there. The The wind just rips across it. Like it's easily blowing gale force. And they're out there in this little boat. It's not much bigger than this because they didn't have really big ships. It's big enough for 12 people. It ain't too big. They're out there nothing but a paddle and they're fighting the waves. And then here comes Jesus walking on the water. And he says, yeah, if I, Jesus, let me come to the water. And then I feel like Peter, he always overspoke himself a little bit, you know. He said, Jesus, if it's really let me come walk on the water. He said, okay, come on. I bet Peter was like, I won't really think he's going to say yes. And and then Peter becomes the only man on earth to step out of the boat, out of his comfort zone, not use the blame. Think about all the things that Peter could have done to be reasons why not to get out of the boat and not take that step of faith into the ocean that night. He might not know how to swim. There weren't no swimming classes back then. That it was a storm. That he couldn't swim back to land. I mean, there's so many reasons it was dark. He wouldn't even known how to get back in the boat had he not been able to. The waves and stuff would have carried him off just like that. There was a many excuse I could have come up with when Jesus said, come to me. I could have said, ah, well, you know, you're Jesus and I'm Peter. I could have said, ah, well, there's a storm out there and you're the king of the storm, but I'm not. So I want to use this excuse. No. Peter didn't use anything, any reasons, any excuse. Peter got out of the boat, and he did what no man else has done in the history of mankind. He walked on the water for a few steps toward Jesus. He walked on the water. And the thing is, once he gets out here in the water, what people don't realize about this story is that once he gets out here on the water, it's not up to Peter. It's about Jesus. If Peter drowns, it's on Jesus at the point. Because he's walking on the water, not in Peter's strength, but in Jesus' strength. When people don't realize about faith, I'm getting off on a tangent here, but people don't realize about faith. If you're struggling, if you're struggling, you can have all the excuses in the world, but the biggest step, that first step of faith that you have isn't in Jesus' power. It's in your power. I can make that step out of the boat. 
And only after that first step of power in my own faith, when God's faith steps in and when the supernatural comes and a miracle happens. Tiny, great moves, great miracles are spurned by one little step of faith in your own power. But you've got to get rid of the excuses and the reasons not to take that step of faith. And trust God. Trust Him for who He is. Maybe one day you'll walk on water. I'm walking on it right now. It ain't so bad. And we're going to keep on with, the, with the, the theory of Peter here. Luke. This is a Peter day. Luke chapter 22. Verse 31 through 34. And this is the Last Supper. I go here so much uh, to the Last Supper because I believe so many things happen because um, Jesus is about to die. He's about to go to heaven. Like People are becoming their identity. People are becoming who God says them to be. Like So many things are shaping up, shaking out in this, this kind of scripture. But I always go to here and I always find something new each and every day. I found so much meat this week looking at it. But um, this is, um, during the Last Supper, it says, um, this is Jesus. And he's talking to Peter right here. And Peter's name before it was Peter was Simon. He says, Simon, Simon. He says, Satan is asked to sift each of you like wheat. And I looked at it and I wondered why Jesus called Peter Simon. But I think Jesus was calling Peter Simon because Peter still wasn't Peter yet. Because he was still that, that he was kind of going back to that place of doubt. And Jesus knew that. He said, but I pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. It's cool that Jesus prays for us that our faith should fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. See, Jesus said this because Jesus knew that Peter's faith was about to be tested in a way far greater than, than, than any other disciples. Peter was going to have a faith war coming up right after Jesus' death. Where Jesus get, we gets executed. And Jesus is praying for him. He, Peter said, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you and even die with you. And Jesus said, Peter, no, you're not. Let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you'll deny me three times that you even know me. So the man that had enough faith to step out of the boat and walk on water to Jesus didn't have enough faith when his back was against the wall to see even say that he knew Jesus. We go through those ups and downs in our faith. We go through those things. And once you turn to something else, Peter went on that night and he denied Jesus three times. Matter of fact, I read... I read it all over again and, and as Jesus is literally in there uh, getting getting whipped getting spat on getting cursed in there before people that hate his guts Peter stood outside the wall and each time somebody came up to Peter and said hey don't you know Jesus why aren't you in there with him he said I don't even know the guy he said I don't even know the guy imagine what kind of how you would have felt if one of your best friends on earth if you're in there getting tried, getting spat on, getting cursed at, getting beat, and your best friend, somebody who said they loved you and would stick it out thick or thin, is out there claiming not even know you. Think about how much that would hurt. I want you to turn to John chapter 21 for me. It's going to be our last bit of scripture here. John 21. Peter denied Jesus three times that night. He said he didn't know him. No. But then Peter did something, and he went back that night, and as soon as the rooster crowed, he knew in his heart what he had done. He knew in his heart that slide of faith which he took. And the Bible says that Peter went and he wept bitterly, and he repented, and he turned back to Jesus. His biggest failure in faith become his biggest moment to grow. And Peter didn't just sit there and he wallow in his misery and his failure, but Peter knew when it was time. Peter knew when he messed up and he took the blame for what he did that night for saying, I don't know you, Jesus. 
Peter didn't blame that it was a scary situation. Peter didn't blame the people that kept asking them. Peter didn't blame that none of the other disciples were there, that he was the only one there. No, Peter, Peter sucked it up like a man, and Peter said, You know what, God, I'm sorry. And it says he wept bitterly. His heart broke for what he had done, and he took responsibility for his failure, for his biggest failure. And he don't get into a lot of details, but, but Jesus went on and he died. We don't see what happens to Peter. We, we know he's around with the, with the disciples. We know he's in the upper room. We know he sees Jesus. But then a, few, uh, a couple of weeks after Jesus rose again, they're out there on the boat fishing. And I think it's cool because I know, I know what I do when I hurt and I do things I'm comfortable with. Peter was a fisherman. I think Peter was hurting. He was lost. He didn't know what else to do, so he was out there fishing doing something just trying to to fill a void and maybe peter was still feeling feeling a little guilty because his very last some of his very last moments where jesus was jesus remembering him that you know peter denying that he even knows him maybe peter's feeling a little guilty chapter 21 verse 15 through 19 Jesus shows up on the shore. They're out there fishing, and Jesus t- tells the guys, he says, throw your nets on the other side. They haul in. They've been fishing all night, hadn't caught a fish. They hauled in more fish than they'd ever caught in their lives. And then they, they, he runs up there to the shore. Peter strips off, runs up there to the shore, and he's looking at Jesus face to face for the first time since Jesus. He says, after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter. He said, Simon, he said, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. He said, then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question. He said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord. You know I love you. He says, then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. And a third time he asked him, he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, yes, Lord, you know I, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and you went wherever you wanted to go. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you, take you where you don't want to go. And Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would have to glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me, follow me. Jesus has hit some of his very first quiet time with Peter since he woke up, since he got up from the dead. He looked at Peter, he said, Peter, do you love me? Because Jesus knew that he denied him. And three times Peter denied him, three times Jesus asked, do you love me? And then something incredible happened. Now it's important to take responsibility because responsibility is what leads you to conviction. is what leads you to repentance. It's what leads you to become a better you. Taking the blame, taking responsibility, that is up to you. That is a God-given thing. Well, Peter did that. It's important to do that. Just as much as it's important to take the responsibility to change, it's important to let go of blaming yourself for your past faults and your past mistakes. Because what a lot of people do is they blame who they used to be for a reason why they're not going to be who God calls them to be. I used to be this person. There's no way I can be a pastor. I used to, y'all don't know what I used to do. I used to do so and so. I used to do so and so. I used to hang out with this crowd. And they'll use that, who they used to be, as an excuse. That becomes their biggest failure on their worst day of their lives becomes the reason why they say Jesus can't use them today. And I want you to look at something incredible. Peter's biggest failure. Peter went in one month from saying, I don't know Jesus, to Jesus looking at Peter in the eye and giving Peter the responsibility, the chief responsibility of the early church. Everything Jesus had invested his whole ministry in, he looked at Peter. He said, you know what? You're going to be the leader of this church. 
Like we're going to have 12 disciples run this thing, but Peter was the chief among elders back then. Jesus overlooked Peter's greatest failure. Now Peter could have used his greatest failure. He could have looked at Jesus and I and he could have said, look Jesus, look, I know you really weren't there, but like you were right, Jesus, you were right. While you were in there getting whooped, I was saying I didn't know you. Like I don't have that faith. You don't know what I've done, Jesus. You don't know how I betrayed you. But Peter didn't do that. Peter knew that Jesus was calling him to be greater than his worst mistake. As Kevin comes up here and he closes us out. Kevin's got a good song today. I love it because it just it speaks to who you used to be versus where you're going. Um, if you let that's why it's important I always say to always be in prayer to God because God is the voice of truth to your heart let me tell you something God convicts you so you can change to be better the devil condemns you so you'll always stay the same and always stay hopeless there's a huge difference between conviction and condemnation there's a lot of people still living in condemnation not conviction You used to be messed up, so what? Have you changed? If you're changed now, you're where God wants you. Quit beating yourself up for your worst mistake and let God move in who you are now and who you will be in the future. So he closes out. Think about it. The altar's open. I love you.